The Radio Memories Network is brought to you in part by Liberated Syndication. Podcast publishing made easy. Libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. Wagons 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 Well, folks, today we're going to take you on a little trip down nostalgia lane. Okay, you are 10 years old, you're standing in front of the local theater, you've got a quarter in your pocket, and you look up on the marquee and you see the Phantom Rider starring... Well, who would you like for it to star? How about Dennis Moore? Remember Dennis Moore? Great character actor. The Westerns. Well, go ahead and get your popcorn for a dime and your drink. You still got a nickel left over. Here we go. Frontier Gentlemen was a radio western series heard on CBS from February the 2nd to November the 16th, 1958. It's about an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual accounts. But a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Starring John Denner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. The great chief of the Sioux Indians is Sitting Bull. He's a rather difficult chap to meet, especially when he's planning for war. <laughs> Frontier Gentlemen. Here with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual accounts. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. The distance from South Sunday to Rosebud in Montana Territory is about 30 miles. Due to a heavy rainstorm and my lack of funds, it had taken me a week to reach Rosebud. Luckily, when I arrived, my remittance from England, $250, had already been forwarded, and I was once again solvent. After posting off my weekly report to the London Times, I went to the most likely place in Rosebud to get local color and information. Except for the bartender polishing his glasses and a cat on the bar, the place was quite empty. I ordered a drink. Two bits. Thank you. It's all right. Oh, hush up, cat. Where are you from, mister? London. London, England? That's right. Well, if that don't beat all, my great-grandpa come from there. Uh -huh. <laughs> Jackson Beeson's the name. J.B. Kendall. Well, howdy. How do you do, sir? Uh, tell me, Mr. Beeson, what's the situation with the Indians these days? Well, now you come to the right place for that bit of news. Oh, get away, cat. Yes, sir, we're going to have trouble. You can thank your stars that we got General Gibbon here keeping an eye out. I hear tell Custer's on his way, too. Oh, bad as that, huh? Worse. Well, just yesterday, correspondence fella like you, he come in, works on the Montana Telegraph News. Uh, Jackson, he says, them Sioux is working up to a boil. Oh, it's going to be wicked. Mighty wicked. Do you think it'll mean war? I don't have to think. I know. I get... You cat! Get out of here! Go on! Get out! Get out! Get out. <laughs> Darn cat's a regular drunkard. <laughs> Uh, this correspondent chap, is he still here? Charlie Meeker? Oh, sure. He's around somewhere. I'd like to meet him. Right nice fella. Uh, now, let's see. You might try up to Dolly's place. Cross the street there. Second house on the right. Can't miss it. Just ask for Charlie. He rooms at Dolly's. Thanks very much. Mm-hmm. And, uh, look, if he ain't there, I'll tell him you're looking for him when he comes back. Uh, you stop by tonight. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Well, hello, early bird. Uh, good afternoon, uh, madam. <laughs> uh, this this is, is Dolly's place? Why, sure it is. You come on in. Uh, it's nice and warm inside, honey. Uh, yeah, I, I'm looking for a gentleman named Charles, Charles Meeker. Charlie? What do you want with him? Oh, well, I was told I could find him here. The bartender... Oh, of... Jack Beeson sent you. Yes. Well, yes. all right. Well, step inside. I'm freezing my... Mary! Go wake up, Charlie. There's a fella here to see him. I guess you better wait in the parlor. Say, now, I hope you'll forgive the looks of this room. Some of the boys got a little rowdy last night. <laughs> uh, we haven't cleaned it up yet. Not at all. Charming. You're new in Rosebud, ain't you? Yes. Well, that's nice. That's real nice. I can see you're a gentleman. It's always nice to meet a gentleman. Uh, sit down. Make yourself comfortable. Mr... Uh, Kendall. Well, Mr. Kendall... You're a friend of Charlie's, huh? No. No, we've never met. Well, he's a nice boy. He's real nice. He sure never forgets me. Anytime he's in these parts, he brings old Dolly a present. Uh, can I get you a drink? No, thanks just the same. Hey, uh, you ain't a dominie, are you? Uh, dom? A preacher? Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I sure do admire to hear you talk. I wish you'd say something else. Somebody um, looking for me, darling. Oh, this here is Mr. Kendall, Charlie boy. All right. How do you do, sir? Well, you've got business to talk, so make yourselves at home. It's sure been a pleasure, Mr. Kendall. Maybe you'll call again. Thank you very much. You'll have to excuse me, Kendall. I just woke up. Big night. Oh. And a big head. What can I do for you? I understand you write for a newspaper, Mr. Meeker. Charlie. Yeah, Virginia City, Montana Telegraph News. I know. I do some correspondence myself for the London Times. Hey, I'm proud to meet you. May I return the compliment? Uh, look here. Is it true what I've been hearing, these rumors about a Sioux uprising? Yeah, more than rumors. It's coming. Well, this chief, Sitting Bull, have you ever seen him? Once. A few years back. Big council between one of our government commissions and the Indian. Oh, I'd like to meet him. See him, you know? No, not a chance. Not anymore. A while ago, maybe, but... Those Indians don't trust the white man now. I tell you, they're getting ready for war. Is there any way to make contact with him? Probably. There's plenty of Indian scouts, interpreters hereabouts who could, but you know, for a white man, it'd be worth his scalp. How would one go about it? Are you serious? Completely. Do you know where I could find him? Uh, I got a pretty good idea. You want a drink? No, thank you. There's talk of a whole lot of Indians moving off the reservations, going up Tongue River country. Might be headed for Sitting Bull's camp. How far would that be? Thirty miles, maybe. <laughs> now, listen, mister. When the Sioux go on the warpath, the best place for you and me is someplace else. Well, do you think you could find me one of those Indian scouts? Someone to guide me to Sitting Bull's camp? You mean it, don't you? Absolutely. What a story. Interview with Chief Sitting Bull? Oh, it's crazy. They'd kill us, Sure. No, Kendall, the best thing for you is to talk to some of the old-timers. They'll tell you about him, and then you can send your report in on that. It's a whole lot safer. That evening in Beeson's saloon, Charlie Meeker found a half-breed interpreter, Johnny Duchel. He was a big man, dark, with handsome features, and when he smiled, which he did constantly, there was something at odds in his eyes, veiled, a coldness. He is playing a game of solitaire... And as he dealt his cards, I noticed that inside his sleeve was a wrist holster, strapped to it a derringer. You want to talk with Sitting Bull? That's right, Johnny. Him too? Me too. Suppose he don't want any talk with you. Suppose he want to take your scalp. <laughs> that would be rather awkward. Johnny, how well do you know the chief? How well does any man know another? Charlie says you've done scouting work for General Crook. Well... Doesn't that make you Sitting Bull's enemy? Yesterday I scout for the soldier. Tomorrow maybe I fight with the Indian. 
Who knows? Yes. Well, the point would seem to be, whose side are you on if you do guide us? If I do this thing, you put your trust in me. I see. Well, what do you say, Johnny? Can you take us to him? Uh, black ace on the red two. Yeah. You got $50, Silver? Kind of high, isn't it? Sitting bull, one big chief. You want me to take you to Red Cloud, crazy horse? Maybe cost less. What do you think, Ken? I'm not sure. Maybe you find somebody, do it for less. he would take you to India and cut out your heart, huh? Now Johnny's all right. Twenty-five apiece would be worth it. All right. When, Johnny? Tomorrow. Fine. Take no guns. Hey, wait the a Indians minute. Indians see you with guns, they say you're coming for no good. Without guns, in peace. No guns. It's sort of risky, isn't it, Johnny? Not with me, along with you. What time? We meet outside the state station. Six o'clock. See you then. Well, you still want to go? I'm not sure about that fellow. That's a chance you take these days. We can back out. No. But to be on the safe side, Charlie, I think two guns in shoulder holsters would make me feel a bit better. Sure. You got them? Never use a gun myself. Oh. Oh, yes, yes, I've got them. Look here, Charlie. Now, this is my idea. No need for you to come along, you know. What's the matter? You want the story for yourself? No, no, not that at all. I'm sorry. I only thought that... Forget it. We'll go together. Hey, how about coming over to Dolly's with me for nightcap? Uh, No, thanks. Not tonight. Sleep for me. Oh. Well... See you in the morning. We can pick up horses at the livery stable. So long. I watched him walk away, a rather short, thin man, shoulders a little rounded. And then he was lost in the shadows, and I had that odd sensation of having lived this moment before. It had been in Peshawar, in northern India. I remembered a good friend who had walked away from me in the night. The next morning, his head was thrown through the barracks window. In a moment, we return to Frontier Gentlemen. Laugh and the world laughs with you. Cry and say, where'd everybody go? Chances are they've taken off in the direction of CBS Radio's Peter and Mary show. Peter Lind Hayes and Mary Healy have a magic way of banishing the blues. Their amusing notions about practically everything, the easy way they sing their songs, and the exciting personalities who visit them all make CBS Radio's Peter and Mary show a cure for the blues. Listen for them on most of these same stations tomorrow. And now we return you to Anthony Ellis' production of Frontier Gentlemen. The morning was gray, a bit windy. We left Rosebud at six o'clock and rode steadily toward the southeast. I could see no sign of a gun on our guide, Johnny Duchel, but his bulky jacket could have hidden an arsenal. For perhaps over an hour, we didn't speak. Charlie, red-eyed from want of sleep and too much whiskey, nodded in his saddle. The half-breed traveled a little ahead of us, cautious, watchful. Hey, Kendall. Yes? Never drink Dolly's rot gut. (laughs) I won't. I can take the pepper, even the tobacco juice she puts in it. But that whiskey... You know, we had a cure for your complaint in India. Oh? Curry powder, ginger, a snake's head, preferably a cobra, a big spoon of sugar, stew the whole thing in a pot of strong tea, and then drink it down. (laughs) Exactly. It's a miraculous cure. You'd probably end up chucking the whole mess out the window, but you forgot your headache. What were you doing in India? Army, mostly. Officer? At one time, Captain... See much fighting? Enough. Who are you with? Uh, Cavalry regiment. You don't like to talk about it much, do you? (laughs) No, not much. Hey, better hold up. Johnny's seen something. In timber. Cheyenne, I think. You stay. I talked to them. How 
How many? Can you see? Five or six. Might be others in the woods. You know something funny? I'm scared. I think about your headache. No, thanks. Too close to my hair. You ever see a scalp man? No. But I shouldn't worry. The tribesmen do much nastier things to get their trophies in India. Johnny must know them. Look. <laughs> All very friendly. Hello. They must have given their blessings. You think so? Either that or Johnny has made an arrangement with them to cut our throats. He looks happy enough. That tall wolf and his brave. They will ride to the council. Tell of our coming. Glad to hear it. We go on now. Johnny smiled, turned away, and we rode on. I had the distinct feeling that he knew exactly what he was doing, and we didn't. Another hour passed. If there were more Indians about, we didn't see them. The terrain was becoming more rugged, and when we reached a narrow stream, Johnny called a halt. We rest the horses. All right. I think I'll get myself a drink. Water, that is. Funny we haven't seen any more Indians, Johnny. They all had great counsel. Mm. You seem pretty sure we won't be attacked. I told Tall Wolf you come in peace. And possibly there are others beside Tall Wolf who won't feel as he does. Possibly. We see at the council. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not worried, though. I am not worried. You're smiling. Good for a man to smile. <laughs> Depends on his reason. I smile because you paid me 50 silver dollars to bring you here. Ah. Uh, tell me, Johnny, what will it cost to take us back? The cost to you will not matter. I think you will not be going back. He made a slight movement with his hand, and a derringer appeared in it. For a moment, I had forgotten his wrist holster. He was standing no more than four feet from me, and I didn't move. If you've ever seen what a 41 derringer can do to a man, you'd understand. Then he brought out a revolver from his jacket and backed away a few steps. That was when I saw Charlie at the stream. He had a rock in his hand, his arm cocked back. At the moment he threw it, the half-breed turned and saw him. Uh, Where are you hit, Charlie? Chest. Boy, that feels worse than Dolly's rock gut. He's not dead? No, I'm not dead, you stinking breed. You, Kendall, take off your jacket. Ah. Uh. Uh. Untie those shoulder holsters. Let them fall to the ground. Uh. Move back. Uh. Stop. Uh. You both got more silver. Give uh. it to me. I'll spit in your eye first. I told Tall Wolf, I take you to Sitting Bull as my prisoner, alive. He will think well of me, give uh, me place of trust. Uh, Your own mother wouldn't trust you, Johnny. Uh, With much silver, two horses, even a stinking breed will be important man. Uh, give it to me. You'll find a bag in my jacket. Uh, <laughs> Good. Now, you both, you walk. I ride behind. Can you get up, Charlie? Sure. Yeah, I'll help you. Uh, ah! It's my fault. I should have done something sooner. I wasn't sure about him. Uh -huh. Walk! What? Cross the street. Follow the trail. Come on. Lean on me. Uh -huh. I can't go on anymore. He is dead. Let me put him on a horse. He called me stinking breed. Let him walk. He can't. He's done in. Then you carry him. Let him rest for a minute. A minute. Charlie. Charlie, can you hear me? Uh -huh. Listen to me, Charlie. The trail narrows a few yards along. There's a slope on our left. Do you hear me, Charlie? Yeah. I'm going to let you fall. If I can get him to take his eyes off me, there's a knife in my boot. All right. Good luck. All right, Charlie. 
Up you come. Uh, <laughs> Getting close, Charlie. Now, when you fall, mm. keep your head down in case he starts shooting. What a way to die. I could... I could... Dolly's right now. If we get back alive, I'll join you. Uh, about <laughs> ten more steps, Charlie. Mm. Mm. Now, Charlie. <laughs> For a moment, I had a glimpse of Charlie sliding, falling down the hill slope. Then he disappeared into the underbrush. I turned to face Johnny Duchel, the knife in my hand. Johnny was standing in his stirrups, craning his head to see over the trail's edge. He was no more than 15 feet from me. There must have been a horse shifting its weight to disturb my aim. I threw... And the knife struck high on his shoulder. He half fell from the saddle, and I ran for him. I felt one of the bullets from his gun burn my cheek. Then we were rolling down the hill. Somewhere on the way, he lost the gun, but the, the knife was stabbing. Cut it, bitch. Charlie. Uh, Charlie. It's all right. It's all right, Charlie. He's finished. He's finished. Something tells me we don't get to say sitting bull today. Better luck next time. Hey, Kendall. Whiskey's paid for. But I owe Dolly for room and board. It's only... Charlie? Charlie? I took Charlie back to Rosebud, to Dolly's place. She had me put the little man on the parlor couch. Then she knelt by his side, took his hand in hers. Charlie, boy, it's Dolly. This was my place, huh, mister? Like the one I never had. My good, bad boy. Dolly misses you, Charlie boy. Wake up, son. <laughs> Most of Rosebud attended the funeral of Charles Mika. I sent the story to his own newspaper, as well as to the London Times. And for Charlie... I decided to stay on in Rosebud to have another shot at a meeting with Sitting Bull. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Jeanette Nolan, Lawrence Dobkin, Harry Bartell, and Junius Matthews. Music was composed by Jerry Goldsmith and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Later today, you'll have five more engrossing dramas waiting for you on CBS Radio, starting with Suspense, which today stars Herbert Marshall. You can look forward to plenty of action and plenty of thrills with yours truly, Johnny Dollar, the FBI in Peace and War, Indictment, and Gunsmoke. For good listening, keep listening to CBS Radio. Now, stay tuned for the Ford Roadshow, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentlemen. Johnny Jacobs speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>